Niners. How are you doing? Great by the grace of God. Amen. It's by the grace of God that we can be gathered here. It is by the grace of God that He has enabled me to share His word today. I know that He has a word to speak to all of you. I don't have anything, but He has something for all of you. Amen. So with that, let us commit this time with a word of prayer. Father, thank you, Father, for today that we can be gathered to listen from you, Father. Father, we know that you have a word to speak to us today. I pray, Father, that you will use me as your vessel to speak forth your word, Father. I empty myself before you, Father. Use me, Father. Anoint me, Father, to speak forth what you want to speak, Father. I pray, Father, that throughout the session, throughout the sermon, Father, I will continue to rely on you, Father, that you be the one who speak, Father. Thank you, Father, even for the people who are here and those who are online, Father, I pray, Father, that you will minister to them as well, Father. Thank you, Father. In Jesus Christ's name, we ask and we pray. Amen. Amen. So church, before I start, I would like to take this opportunity to thank God for giving you the message as well as thank Pastor Paul and Sister Sharon for allowing me to share his word in this pulpit. So today, we are continuing on our monthly focus on events. We are on the third week of events for Lifeline. Next week, we have another one before we conclude. What is events? Events is something that happen. What do you think is the greatest event? What is the greatest event in the history? You know, there's a lot of things. I actually Google this question. <laughs> what is the greatest event in history? Some people say, you know, is the World War. Is the time when people uh, invented the light. It's the time when people invented this, invented the airplane and all this. They consider those as great events. But us, as the born-again child of God, the greatest event in history is the events of salvation. And I'm sure all of you know about this. What is this events of salvation? In Proverbs chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out and set up her seven perfect number of pillars. I'm sure all of you know about this seven perfect numbers of pillars. This is basically the event of salvation. The events of salvation. The events of salvation doesn't start when Jesus comes. It started even way before that. But the greatest one is when He came. The first one, the birth of Jesus. The birth of Jesus is one of the great, greatest events in history. This is where Jesus was born out of a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit Himself. The whole world celebrate, the whole world, literally the whole world celebrate the birth of Jesus. That is when we celebrate Christmas 25th of December. The whole world knows, seems to know about this event. And then after Jesus was born, before he start his ministry, he was baptized. The baptism, the second one, the baptism. Many people know about this as well, but a few know the significance of it. The few know the true meaning of this baptism. The baptism of Jesus is the event where John the Baptist baptized Jesus. Why do John the Baptist need to baptize Jesus? So that he can pass all the lifetime of sin of all humanity from Adam until the last man ever be born to the body of Jesus. Just like how in the Old Testament, sin will pass through the laying on of hands by the high priest 
Aaron, the same way John the Baptist came from the Aaronic household, did the same thing. He baptized Jesus, laid his hand upon Jesus, and passed the sin of mankind upon his body. That is when all our lifetime of sin, all our iniquity, all our shortcoming, all our weaknesses were passed unto Jesus. And after he was baptized, he died. After three years, he died. He died on the cross to pay for the penalty of our sin. And after his death, is his burial. The burial. You know, if someone die, we don't bury them, it will be very smelly. This is actually spiritual, physically happened, but it's also spiritually applying to us. When we are baptized into Jesus through his baptism, when we died with him, we also need to be buried with him. Our own nature is no longer alive. We are buried with him. If we are not buried, that is when all our filthiness will come out. That's why the burial of Jesus is also very, very important. The burial. After he was buried, he resurrected. After three days, Jesus resurrected. Because he is God, death could not hold him down. He rose from the dead, he defeated death. And after that, 40 days, he was staying with his disciples and he ascended into heaven, his ascension. And the last one that are yet to happen is his second coming. These are the seven pillars, the events of salvation. And the first six, right, happen within 33 years. Within 33 years from the birth of Jesus until his ascension, 33 years. But for ascension to his second coming is unknown. We don't know how long more he will take to come back. In Thessalonians, it says, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2, For you yourself know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. And in Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, it says, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. We do not know when Jesus will come. We do not know this part. Now, why is this important? A lot of people know about this. A lot of people know that Jesus was born, Jesus was baptized, Jesus died, Jesus was buried, Jesus resurrected, Jesus ascended, and Jesus will come back again. Many people know about these events of salvation. But how does this event of salvation affect our life? That is the most important thing. Within this unknown period, how does these events of salvation affect our life events? You know, in life, we will go through a lot of events. You are born, you go to school, you meet new friends, you graduate, you get a job, you fall in love, you get married, you do this, you do that. There's so many events in our life. How does this events of salvation affect our life events. If the events of salvation doesn't affect our life events, which means we haven't fully understand what this events of salvation is. If this events of salvation doesn't affect what kind of job I get, what kind of partner I have, what kind of friend I'm associated with, something is wrong with our understanding of these events of salvation. Perhaps we do not really understand what is this events of salvation. 
The word says, the grace of God came and appeared so that we will live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. The context of this passage is talking about the grace of God. The grace of God. Why do the grace of God appear? Many people think that the grace of God makes us feel comfortable. I can do this, I can do that. There's no more sin, there's no more condemnation. I can do whatever I want. But that's the wrong understanding of the grace of God. The grace of God teaches us, show us, and lead us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 to 4, it says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the last of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentile. When we walk in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, reveries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regards to this, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. This is Peter saying, hey, guys, do you know that last time in your past life, you are doing all this? You are walking in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, reveries, drinking parties, abominable idolatries. All of us are during our past time. And then, when you change, when we are born again, when we know Jesus, when we have the gospel in our heart, our life takes a turn, complete turn. Repent, we repent, which means we no longer walk the way of destruction, we are walking to, towards the way of life. When our life change, those people who look at us and see us, they will find it strange. They think it strange that you do not run with them anymore. And they will start speaking evil of you. They don't understand you. They don't know what happened to you. Hey, we used to do this kind of thing. How come now you abandon me? These are our past life. Peter is saying, do you not know that we have spent enough, enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles? Before we are born again, I do not know what age you are born again. For me, it was the age of 18. I remember 18 years I was serving the devil. Now I come to know the gospel. I turn away. From my old way of life, I'm walking towards the way of righteousness. Some of my friends left me, but who cares? What is important is the gospel. If we give up on the gospel, then the rest cannot be saved. That's why it's so important for us to walk right with God. We are called out of darkness into His marvelous light. We are called out from our old ways of life into a new life. And today, I want to share about that. How we are to live as the soldiers of Christ. I've en entitled my message as Full-Time Soldiers. Full-Time Soldiers. You know, as I was preparing this message, I come across a quote that says this, very, I find it, wow, very true. Huh? It says, part-time Christian can't defeat full-time devils. Part-time Christian cannot defeat full-time devils. 
You know the devil existed way before, even before Adam existed. He's an ancient beast. He's working full time. And we, as the elects, as the born again child of God, we cannot be part time elects. We cannot be part time soldiers. We cannot be part time Christian. We got to be full time. We got to fight. We got to fight. No matter how hard, we got to fight. It's not we who fight, it's God who fight in us. Amen? And our source text is taken from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 to 9. It says, Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. There are two points I want to share. The one that I highlighted, be sober-minded and brotherhood. My first point is the battlefield. Every war is fought in the battlefield. We, we need to know where is this battlefield? Where do the enemy attack? So that we know how to tackle him. If we do not know where our enemy attack, we will not know how to protect ourselves. That's why we need to see from our main source text, let us see where he attacks. It says, be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a rolling lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Be sober-minded. The battlefield is our mind. Our mind is the battlefield. This is where the devil attacks. This is where the devil put a lot of thoughts in us. That's why it says be sober minded. Our mind needs to be sober. You know the opposite of sober? Drunk. If we are so drunk with the world, that's when the devil will just poop. Kena one, kena two, kena three. We need to be sober minded. Because the devil always play with our mind. He always tell you lies. He's the father of all lies. He's the father of all lies from the very beginning. How he deceived Eve, we can see. How he deceived from the very, very beginning. Our mind. We need to be sober-minded. The devil is working in the mind of people even until today. In the mind of unbelievers, in the mind of believers. In the mind of unbelievers, how did he work? He blinded their mind so that they do not know the light of the gospel. Let us see this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 to 4. It says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers that they cannot see the light of the gospel that display the glory of Christ who is the image of God. The mind, he blinded the mind of the unbelievers. The God of this age, who is this? The devil. He blinded them so that they will not know the light of the gospel. Last week, Sister Sharon shared the marriage supper of the Lamb. She quoted this scripture taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 to 4. Verse 1 and 2, actually, she quoted. Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. And indeed, you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin 
to Christ, which means we are betrothed to one husband, which is Jesus Christ. This passage of scripture, actually, Paul is concerned of the faithfulness of these people, the Corinthian church. He's concerned of their faithfulness. And then the next verse, he will talk about if. Let us read. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceive Eve with, by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. What is it, Ern? It says, Paul is fearful. Paul is concerned of the fate of the Corinthian church. Just like how the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness to our mind. If we are not strong in the faith, when someone preach another Jesus, another Jesus, the gospel that is not of the gospel of water and spirit, it's not the gospel of God's righteousness, baptism, death, and resurrection. It may sound the same. They may end up swallowing it as well. If we are not strong in our faith, if we are not strong in this gospel, if we do not know the difference between our gospel and another gospel, we will well put up with it. That's why we need to be strong in the gospel. We need to know what the gospel contains. We need to know what is this gospel? How is it different from another gospel? It is very different. It may look very similar, the same, but when you dissect and see, wow, it's so different. It is not the same at all. The gospel that we believe is the gospel that is pure, the gospel of God's righteousness, which consists of Jesus' baptism, death and resurrection. The gospel that saved our soul, we know that Jesus was baptized at the age of 30 to take all our lifetime of sin. He died for our sin. He rose again so that we can together be risen together with Him. It's no longer we who live, but Christ lives in us. That is the gospel that we believe. It's no longer we, we no longer live in our old life, like what Peter said. Before we know God, we, we live in our old life. We live the way of the Gentile, so drunk, so full of, don't know, dirty thoughts. We no longer live there. We are living in a new life. Our life is no longer the same. It's a new life altogether. It's not the extension of our old life. It's a new life altogether. That's why this gospel is so important. We need to know where the devil attacks. The devil attacks always our mind. When we are not strong in our faith, when the leaders rebuke you, when someone speaks against you, when you are doing something that is not right, you will go against them. The devil will put a lot of thoughts in your mind. See, that person don't like you. See, the, the church, all these people, they are very judgmental. See, all of those are from the devil. He play with our mind. You know, those people who left church, we love them. If they come back, we embrace them. But what keeps them away? The devil blinded their mind. They think that if I come back, they will judge me. They will think of me like this. They will think of me like that. Who will think of you? We have so many things to think about. We don't think about you. So, you know, it's all the mind game, you know. It's the mind game. This is our battlefield. That's why it's so important to know where the devil attack. He always attack our mind. Attack our mind. You are not good enough. You just sinned. You just did that. You just did that. He will attack you until you feel so defeated, you can't rise up again. That's why we need to put up the new mind. Put up the new mind. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 to 8, it says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. 
But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, the mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. After we are born again, we still have the mind of the flesh and the mind of the spirit. And it says, the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of governed by the spirit is life and peace. Which one do we want to choose? The mind of Christ or our fleshly mind? When we walk in our flesh, we all have different battles in life. It can be your job, it can be your relationship, it can be your family, it can be finance, it can be anything. The devil always attacks our mind. Sometimes the things that we are worried about is not even reality. It's not even something that will happen. But the devil will just put thought in you. You cannot finish your work. You cannot do this. You cannot take your leave. You cannot do this. He will attack your mind so bad until you are like, ah, I cannot anymore. That is exactly what the devil wants you to do. But the moment that he attacked our mind, come back, shift it, put to death our own nature, and say, God, you are the one who fight the battle. The devil is too strong for me. I cannot fight this. This battle is just too difficult for me. Help me, Father. Guide me, Father. Teach me, Father. During this time, rely on him even more. Whatever thought, dirty thought that he put in your mind about God, about his leaders, about the church, put it aside. Know that if it takes you away from God, it is not of God. Anything that takes you away from God, it is not of God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 to 24. Strip yourself of your former nature. Put off and discard your old, unrenewed self, which characterizes your previous manner of life and becomes corrupt through lust and desires that spring from delusion and be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude and put on the new nature, the regenerated self created in God's image, God light in true righteousness and holiness. It says, strip yourself of your former nature. Strip it off. Put it off. Discard your old unrenewed self and be renewed. Be renewed where? In the spirit of your mind. Renew our mind. Renew our mind. Whenever there is thought that is unpleasing unto God, unrighteous thought, renew our mind. Thank Him always for the gospel of God's righteousness. If there's any dirty thought in our mind, just confess it to Him. God, wow, such a dirty fellow that you have saved. I'm such a filthy folk, sinners. But yet, through Jesus' baptism, how He took all my lifetime of sin, I am no longer having sin in my heart. The more you do that, the more grateful and the more thankful you are of the gospel. You become so thankful of the gospel. Wow, God, you saved someone like me. The more ugliness showed up, the more we glorify God. It's not that, ah, oh, I'm so bad, I'm so filthy, I'm so, I'm good for nothing. That's exactly what the devil wants us to feel and to, to think. But just tell him, tell the devil, yes, exactly this who I am. And because of that, my God has saved me. He has saved me through His baptism, death and resurrection. Today I can have a, have a new life. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Put Him back in His place. The devil will play in our mind. Put condemnation. Put different thoughts in our head. Put Him back. Put Him back. We are full-time soldiers. We don't just fight in the morning. At night you go sleep. Soldier need to be ready all the time. The devil can attack you in the midnight. The devil can attack you in the halfway of you working, halfway of you driving. Just some thought, oh yeah, what happened if this happened? Put it back. God, 
You are in control. You are in control of everything. I don't have to worry. My life is in your hand. This is the battlefield. I know this is the battlefield. I know where to fight. I know where to fight. Amen? And that's why Colossians, it says, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Set our mind on the things above. Set it. Set it on the things above. When we have thoughts that we cannot control, we cannot... You know, this is something that I think most of us are struggling. All of us are struggling on this. Our thought. So many thoughts in our mind. So many thoughts in our head. Last time, the soldiers are very active, fighting. Even now, there are still soldiers who are fighting, but not as much as last time. But today, we are also fighting. Where's the battlefield? Here. No one can see. When I see Benji, when I see Ellie, I don't see the battle that they fight. I just see their outer appearance. Maybe they can be smiling, you know, uh, can be happy. But there's battle. There's always battle. And I really love in part. That's where we share. And I realize that, wow, when we come to church, when we see people, it looks like everything is okay and good, but actually everyone is fighting a battle. Sometimes we don't talk about it. Sometimes we don't want to share about it because we feel that no one will understand me anyways. The battle that I face is different from the battle that you face. No one can understand me. We always think that no one can understand me. For what share? After that, what can you do? Of course we can do something. We can pray for you. That's also one of the weapons that God has given to us. Amen? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 6, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not walk according to the flesh. For the weapon of our welfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments on every high things that exalt itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all this obedience when your obedience is fulfilled. It says, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The name of Jesus is very powerful. When we have thoughts that we cannot control, bring every thought to captivity to the obedience of Christ. Because Christ can handle it, we cannot. Sometimes our thoughts are so wild, we cannot handle it. We cannot face it. We cannot control and we feel like, ah, it's driving me insane. Bring it to the captivity, to the obedience of Christ. When God asks us to go for battle, He didn't leave us unprepared. He gave us the armor. The armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. It says, Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The armor of God. The belt of truth, shield of faith, breastplate of righteousness, sword of the spirit, gospel of peace, helmet of salvation, prayer. There are seven. Peace, perfect peace in the armor of God. And for our mind, God has given us helmet. It's called helmet of salvation. Why is it helmet of salvation? Because if the battle is happening here, what is the aim of the devil? He wants to take away our salvation. He wants to take away the gospel from us. Sometimes when our thoughts are so full, we feel like giving up. That's exactly what the devil wants to do. But that's exactly when we're going to put up that helmet of salvation. Let us read this in Ephesians chapter 6. It says, Therefore, take up. Pay attention. It says, 
take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your race with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shot your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the sins. Pay attention. It says, take up the whole armour of God. Take it up. There is an action of taking up. It's not that you wake up, suddenly your armour is already on you. It doesn't happen like that. You put it on. You take it up. Take it up. Wear it. Every piece. Wear it. And for helmet also, it says, take the helmet of salvation. Put it on. Don't just, the helmet is there. Never mind. I just go without wearing the helmet. Take, take the helmet. Take the helmet and put it on. I'm a righteous child of God. No matter what the devil lies to me, I'm always righteous. Not because of what I do, but because of what he has done. Sometimes, Different people have different weakness. Some people are more weak than another. Some people have done more sin than another. Sometimes the devil will lie to us, tell us all sorts of deceitful thought in us. And his ultimate purpose is to take away our salvation from us. You are not good enough. No one will love you. God don't forgive you anymore. Put on that helmet and say, God, this is what I have in my thought. It's so wild. It's so difficult. It's so... I cannot take this. Ruminate on the gospel. Ruminate on the gospel. Put on the gospel of God's righteousness. Thank God for the gospel. Whatever mistake that we make, confess it to Him. God, this is exactly what I have done. This is what I have done. I have scolded someone, I have done this, I have done that. Confess it to him and say, God, but I thank you that through Jesus' baptism, all my lifetime of sin has been taken away. He died, I died. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Help me to walk in the Spirit so that I do not do this. This displeased you a lot, God. Help me to live a life that is pleasing unto you. That is how we come back. Not feeling condemned, I done this again. Oh, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done this. Oh, yeah, I don't think God will love me. I don't think God will forgive me. I don't think God will do this, do that. Oh, yeah, you see, my job is so difficult. I think uh, God is punishing me. Uh. I think God is doing this to me. Uh. Oh, the devil will just put all this kind of thought in your mind. If we do not know that God loves us, we will think that God is punishing us. God is doing this and that. But the truth is, you are always righteous in the sight of God. No matter what happened. It's not what you do, you know. If it is based on what you do, then of course lah. You're not righteous. None of us are righteous. None of us can be righteous. That's why we need God. That's why we need His grace. So that we can live soberly, righteously in these last days. Amen? Amen? And with that, I'm going to my second point now. Going back to our source text, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 to 9. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a rolling lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. First point is the battlefield. Our mind, this is where the adversary attacks. He's seeking someone. Not everyone he can devour. He's seeking someone who is not sober, who is drunk with the world, who is so 
in their own world, pop, he will devour. And then the second point I want to share is this. The keyword is brotherhood. My second point is the army. You know, when we fight a battle, we need the army. You see, the soldier doesn't fight alone. Every soldier belongs to an army. Every soldier belongs to an army. None of us can fight alone. None of us can fight alone. Every soldier belongs to an army. If a soldier, let's say you are, belong to an army, but you go out of that group of army, that's when the enemy will attack you. Soldiers need to be always together with the army. We fight together, we drink together, we eat together, we do everything together. Because if we are not together, we are weak. We are weak. By ourselves, we are weak. That's why the song Soldiers of Christ is not I am the soldier of Christ. We are the soldiers of Christ. We are fighting a war. We! Who are this army? This army is the church of God. If we don't belong to the church of God, if we don't belong to the army, then something is wrong. If let's say we go for a war and then one of the soldiers just go out strolling around, pop, die. But if there is someone, let's say two or three, oh, you want to go there? Let, let's go together. Let's go together. At least if something happened to you, the other two or the other one can go back to the place and call the others to come and rescue you. If you go alone, who's going to help you? That's why the church of God is so important. The church of God is the army. We are the army. We are the soldiers of Christ in the army of God. We are not fighting a war against flesh and blood. Against flesh and blood is okay, but it's in our mind. In our thoughts. You know when uh, Abraham was about to rescue Lot, he did not rescue Lot by himself. He actually called out his trained men. 318 trained men. Let us read Genesis chapter 14 verse 14. It says, when Abraham heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as then. Abraham also doesn't fight alone. He didn't go just by himself. Okay, I'm going to rescue Lot. Do you think he can rescue Lot? No. He go with his trained men. We go together as the church of God. Everything happened. We as the church of God, united as one, encourage, strengthen, help, guide, teach, lead, everything within the church of God. In the Old Testament, there is a law, there is a principle. If you want to join army, soldiers, you need to fulfill some of the criteria. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 1 to 9. Principles governing warfare. When you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. So it shall be, when you are on the verge of battle, that the priests shall approach and speak to the people. And he shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemy. Do not let your heart faint, do not be afraid, and do not tremble or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is He who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies 
to save you. Then the officers shall speak to the people, saying, What man is there who has built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. Also, what man is there who has planted a vineyard and has not eaten of it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man eat of it. And what man is there who is betrothed to a woman and has not married her? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man marry her. The officer shall speak further to the people and say, What man is there who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return to his house, lest the heart of his brethren faint like his heart. And so it shall be, when the officers have finished speaking to the people, that they shall make captain of the armies to lead the people. This is the principles of becoming part of the soldiers, part of the war. He says, if any one of you planted a vineyard, you haven't eat your fruit, go back. Go back and eat it first. Or else you die and no one eats. If you build a house, haven't stay, stay there first. Or else you die and no one stays. If you are betrothed to a woman, haven't marry her, go back, go marry her. Or else another man will marry her. Only those who are strong will go for that war. You know what? Look around yourself. Look around your left, right, back, front. You guys are the soldiers that God knows that you can fight. God knows that you are able to handle it. It's not by your strength, it's by His strength. With our strength, we are fearful, we are faint-hearted. But with His strength, we are not. God, you called me, you chose me, you guide me, you are the one that led me through. All of you are those who left everything. Left everything. You could have been somewhere now, watching movie. You could have gone some holiday. It's a long holiday. You could have been somewhere. But you are here today because you love God more than anything else. You love God more than your house. You love God more than your vineyard. You love God more than this woman. You love God more than anything else. That's why you are here. That's why you are here. You belong to the army. That's why you want to fight. You want to listen to God's word. You want to learn how to fight. That's why you are here. We are the body of Christ who are baptized into Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 to 14. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentile, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. We all are baptized into Christ. We all have become one. We become one army in this local church, NCCKL. There are many more, many more armies in, the, in this warfare all around the world. Our NLM brothers and sisters, they are all also fighting the battles. We are part of that army in the bigger scale, the universal church. But we here, NCCKL, As the local church, we belong to this army. We are to unite as one. No matter what adversary, what challenges, we're going to fight. We're going to fight. Yesterday, Sister Ellie shared a very good verse. I put it here. Let us read. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32 to 35. It says, think back. Think back on those early Days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful even though it meant terrible suffering? Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and were beaten. And sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same thing. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail. And when all 
you own was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. It says, remember those days when you first time knows Jesus, knows Christ, you remain faithful, though it meant terrible suffering. And then it also talks about how you suffered along with those who were thrown into the jail. Which means this Hebrew writer is saying, hey, you guys have been together, united, army. That's why when someone fall, we lift them out. We don't condemn them. We don't, uh, you, good for nothing. No, we don't condemn them. We lift them out. The army of God contains so many types of soldiers. Some are weak, some are strong. Not everyone is strong like you. Some people are weak. But they are part of the army. We don't throw them. We don't just say, uh, don't know how to fight. Don't know how to do this. Don't know how to do that. Condemn them. No. We are all different. Different makeup, different way of being raised. But we are called to be the, in the army of God. We are to fight this battle of life. Amen? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 to 4, it says, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engage in warfare and tangle himself with the affair of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. We are to endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ. It says no one, no, no soldier fight and then at the same time think about this, think about that. If you can't focus in fighting, you will lose both. If you focus on fighting, you will win the war and go back to wherever you want to go. You want to go back, reach out to your family, you can reach out. But if you lose that war, you will lose both. You will lose the war, you will lose your family. Which one you want? No one engaged in welfare entangles himself with the affair of this life. There is a proverb that says, if you want to chase two rabbits, you will end up chasing none of it. Focus on one. Focus on fighting that war. Focus on the gospel. Focus on reaching out. Focus on this. Don't focus on the affairs of this world. As long as we are living in this world, we will always have trouble. We will always have difficulties. But that difficulties will cause us to rely on God even more. Amen? And 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12a, it says, If we endure, we shall also reign with Him. If we endure, we shall also reign with Him. Endurance. For the last two weeks, pastors speak about this heart of endurance. I think it really shaped us. How we face trials, how we see trials, reasons for trials. How do we come out of trials? If we endure those trials, we will reign with Him. And I just want to end it with this diagram again. Events of salvation. How does it affect our life? Does it actually affect our life? Or does it not? If the event of salvation has really become a rhema in our heart, our life will change. Our life will change. We are no longer the same person anymore. Our life purpose has changed. It's no longer walking the wrong direction, I'm walking the right direction. This is how the events of salvation will affect our life event. Only when we truly understand this meaning of events of salvation. Thank you.